All right. Okay, so let's get started. Um, one thing that I would love to know that will help me when talking about um, friendships today is how old your kids are. So if you can drop that into the chat box, that's good for me to know if, if we're primarily elementary or middle school, high school. Um, it's just helpful because it's a little bit different on the friendship front. There's a lot of stuff that is relevant for all of the ages, but some of it is relevant just for the littles or the bigs. All right, 15, 17, 11, 9, just about to start high school. Congratulations, that's big. Um, 14, okay, great. Okay, so it looks like we have, okay, seven and eight. So we do have, um, okay, seven-year-old goddaughter. All right, so we have mostly middle school and high school, but young ones too. So as we go, if questions come up specifically about the age for your child, please don't hesitate to ask. I will be watching that. And I knew and Val are here too, to kind of back me up and make sure that I don't miss anything as we go. So, okay, friendship prep. This is what we're here for today. And it's, it's an interesting thing because, you know, we can't do this for our kids. It's an area that we just can't jump in and say, let me fix all this for you. So we are doing this as a midsummer parent chat because um, we just can't wait for the fall for this particular topic. What we found is that, or what I found through research and through talking to lots of teens and parents is that the first three weeks of school are so critical to making new friends and to kind of setting the friendship patterns for the year. So if we were to do this in late September, for instance, it might feel like, oh, we've missed that window. So that's why we're doing this special presentation in July. There's a lot of patterns that are formed like who they're gonna eat lunch with, who they're gonna play with at recess, what clubs they're gonna do, who they hang out with before and after school, who they walk with in the halls. A lot of that stuff happens in the first three weeks. Even the first day of school is very critical. So we just wanted to make sure that you have the tools to prepare your child for the next school year. So it starts with you having this information and then finding a way to bring your child into the conversation and helping them to prepare both with the um, the skills, also the mindset. There's two pieces to this and we wanna make sure that that you have that so you can pass it along to your, your child. Now heading into the new school year, as you can imagine, like think back to when you were a kid, there was an excitement, right? About starting the new school year, but anxiety and stress and excitement sit very close together on the feelings. And we can either feel those nervous, like energy in our body as excitement, or we can feel it as anxiety. And as many of you probably know, these days, a lot of those feelings are interpreted as anxiety. So we want to make sure that as your child is feeling that anxiety, um, those butterflies in their stomach, that we are able to create a little bit more of a plan. I call it a friendship plan because the uncertainty is what really creates that anxiety. So we can't tell them everything that's going to happen, but if we give them the skills, it definitely helps. So heading into the new school year, it really is um, for some kids it really sparks their anxiety, especially if they've been over the summer able to relax and just be themselves, not worry about all the social stuff. Um, the new year is just big, the beginning of school. There's a lot of new possibilities. We see that and they usually see that too, right? But it's also a such a minefield of uncertain social interactions. That's really more than the academics for most kids. It's the social piece that really causes a lot of anxiety. So what do they need? It can be boiled down to four areas for us as parents as we are supporting them, right? So first we need to listen to them, listen to their concerns, listen to the things they're excited about, and just be there with them. We can validate their feelings, whether it's the feeling is of excitement or anxiety, we can validate those feelings without saying, oh, without kind of adding to it, right? We don't have to jump in with them if they're anxious. We don't have to jump in if they're feeling like it's gonna be a horrible school year, but we can say, oh, I understand that feeling. You can say that sucks is a thing that you can kind of, um, for the older kids in middle school and high school, that kind of just sums it up for them doesn't mean you have to say it's 
it's you know a doomsday it's going to be a horrible year you're just listening and you're validating feelings the third piece which is what we're focusing on tonight of course is preparing them with the right skills that they need so that those first three weeks they step into the classroom they step into the halls of school and they're ready to go and then as you watch them go through the ups and downs the emotional ups and downs you're going to be there to support them through that not by fixing it, not by having all the answers, not by trying to make them happy. You're just going to be there to support them as they go through the ebb and flow of new friendships, new connections. Before I truly dive in, I want to ask you, in addition to the ages, I want to know what brought you here tonight. And for some of you, it may be that last year was a really rocky year socially. For others, you may think, ah, oh, it's good to learn. Why not come? Um, for some of you, it may be that um, your kids have been in between friends for quite a while. I, I prefer to use that term than no friends because everybody's friend is out there waiting for them. But it's something that, um, you know, you may be concerned. Or maybe your child, because of the pandemic, many kids really affected. And so they don't have the skills. They're behind in math and they're behind on social skills. So um, just let me know what, what you're here for. Okay. Let's see. And I'll just wait a second. I'll let you think about it. If you're like me, it takes me a minute to think about you know, the answers to questions like this. All right. She doesn't know how to make friends. Yeah, that's one for sure. Um, change of school plus the pandemic. Yeah, there's a change of school, like going up a level, right, from, from elementary to middle, middle to high school, high school to college. And then there's also just changing schools, even like maybe seventh to eighth grade, but changing schools. Maybe they got into a choice school, something like that. All right. Um, okay, all that you said. All right, awesome. Socially challenged anxiety and social pressures. Was hurt by good friends, so scared to reinvest. I totally understand that one. Um, and you, I'm just going to, I'm going to mention this at the very end about a social support group that I've started for girls in particular, that is for middle school and high school girls. And it's a weekly session where we talk about social stuff. And one of the things I find with, with kids who have had friends kind of the friendship ended not so well. Um, they might put up this wall and they don't want to reinvest, like you're saying, into new ones. They don't want to be vulnerable again. And we want to make sure that she's able to pull that wall back down so that she can make new friends because you got to be vulnerable to do that. But it's really hard if you've been hurt, as we all know. Okay, change of new school. I'm struggling with making friends, too nervous to reach out and being quick to judge potential friends. Oh my gosh, this is all yes this is all you're in the right place um the making new friends we're going to talk about that too nervous to reach out when they have some strategies it makes them less nervous to reach out right and then being quick to judge potential friends that's what i kind of it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's also a way to protect themselves if they look at everybody and say no that's not a potential friend that's not then they don't open themselves up for rejection right so it's kind of it's a defense mechanism. Okay. Self-sabotaging. You all are in the right place. All right. Okay. Here's one thing we have to remember. We cannot forget that your child may be feeling a lot of pressure at the beginning of the school year, especially if they had a difficult time last year with friends, as some of you have brought up, right? And <laughs> someone say, I'm nodding. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. It can be high pressure if they feel like you as the parent are expecting them to make new friends. So if, if when you're encouraging them and supporting them after, you know, with the stuff you're learning tonight, if it's all about making new friends, that can feel like a really big amount of pressure, right? Um, so instead of thinking of this as I need to help my kid make friends, I want you to think of it as you need to help your child to make connections. And those connections can potentially become friendships. It really is a way that I work with, with kids to say, you can't control what the other person does but you can control that you are going to reach out and connect to the people around you. Beyond that, it's out of your hands. So um, we're gonna talk about ways in the first few weeks of school to connect 
So I want you to think of it as we're going through this stuff. It's not about how does my kid make friends? It's about how does my kid connect to the people around them, right? And this should relieve some of the pressure for you too, because when our kids are struggling with friendships, we want to fix it. We want to make it better because we know that having friendships makes for a more fulfilling life. But we're going to take that pressure off of our kids and ourselves. We're going to think of it as connecting to the people around you. Okay. Now, as you're working with your child to prepare them for the next year, keep in mind that it's best to encourage and advise rather than lecture. Um, you all have a ton of wisdom, right? You've hopefully learned a lot over the years of how to make new friends or make connections, right? But we have to also remember our kids are on their own journey. They don't have the years on the planet that we do, and they don't have the wisdom yet. And they have to go on this journey to collect the wisdom into their own backpacks, right? Um, we can't pack their backpacks with wisdom for them. They have to do it themselves. So when your child is pushing you away, because they're going to, because they want to, and they should gain independence. And um, the thing is lectures just aren't as effective. So we have to use the idea of encouraging and advising only when they will accept it um, as a way to be more effective in supporting them through these connection things, these friendship issues. So encourage them to experiment, to gather their own wisdom, to venture out into the world, and then offer advice when they're receptive. And when I say when they're receptive, it means when they're not in a heightened emotional state. And the best thing to do is to say, I've got some advice, do you wanna, are you interested in it? Or I've got some ideas, are you willing to hear them? Um, if they say yes, then they're gonna receive it more. But if you just start in with the advice, um, a lot of your kids are gonna just push you away. Now let's talk about relationship skills. We've kind of talked about our own stuff as parents we need to do and think about, but we want you to walk away with concrete ideas of how to, of what to teach your children. And um, there's lots of things we could go over, but I kind of boiled it down to some basics for tonight. So there's something called like the law of attraction and people kind of define it different ways, but it's kind of like like attracts like. And so while we have people in our lives that aren't exactly the same as us, we tend to attract the type of energy that we are putting off in this world. So it's important for your child to build up their confidence and their energy and their willingness to connect with people, because that is what will either push people away or pull them towards your children. So we've got a few ideas tonight on how to do that. These may seem out there, but I'm telling you all the years I've worked with teens, these are things that can really work. So one idea is to have your child wear or have a piece of clothing or an item that represents something they're interested in. So one thing from this summer that is so many people are talking about is the Taylor Swift concert tour, right? So a lot of people went to this Taylor Swift thing, um, concert, and but not everybody did, right? But if your child, for instance, was a Taylor Swift fan, they could wear a Taylor Swift t-shirt. It is a topic of conversation. So even if your kid is shy, this works really well because if they're wearing a Taylor Swift t-shirt, somebody over here is a Taylor Swift fan and they may say, hey, did you go to the concert? It's okay if your child says, no, I didn't get to go, but that starts a topic of, of um, a conversation that is based on a similar interest, right? Or somebody makes fun of them. Either your child can, can play off of that and be okay with it, or maybe your child's like, yeah, okay, so this is not a friend of mine because I'm a total Taylor Swift fan. So, um, but that can really help. Same thing if they are into video games, if they are into um, a certain band or a certain movie like the Marvel series, really think about what do they have that represents that and what can they bring to school that would kind of show that to the world, whether it's a pen on their backpack, it's um, their water bottle with stickers on it, Really, this is a fun one. You can really think of a lot of ways to bring this in. And it's not something that's scary. If your kid is shy, this is super easy for anybody to do, right? 
Okay, the second thing is share something. Um, sharing candy, what kid doesn't like candy? In um, elementary school, you probably can't get away with this most of the time. Middle and high school, it depends on the rules in your kids' classrooms. But if they think about bringing something that's inexpensive, right, like Skittles or, um, I don't know, I don't know what they're eating these days. There's so many different things, but just think of something that is easy to share. Because if your child is sharing candy with their neighbor and somebody else sees it, they're very, Takis, thank you. They're very likely to say, hey, can I have some of those? It's a really easy way to get people to come to you versus going out the other way. And also if you're sharing your pens or you know stickers, things like that. So when my older one was in elementary, he carried his Pokemon cards, yeah. And that always attracted the other kids. Yeah, and Pokemon cards have made a comeback for all ages, I don't know if you know that. But yeah, my kid was just going through them um, who was 23 was just going through her pokemon cards and so was my 25 year old so um but yeah something as easy as pokemon cards you're, you get them out you're looking at them and people might say hey which one is your best one or again it attracts the people that have a similar interest so that's already big bonus points in making connections that could be potential friends all right the next one ask a question about classes and about teachers everybody is going to have that front of mind what classes they're taking and what teachers they have if your kids are in elementary they can talk about you know where they do they know who this teacher is had they had siblings in this teacher's class um are there friends in the other classes there's lots of buzz about that and they can talk about their um like their choir teachers and all of those things. So this is a super easy thing to talk about for anybody the first day of school, but the first few weeks as well. The last thing is body language. This is one that you can really start to work on with your kids if they're open to it. Um, you can't force feed this idea, but you can bring, it, bring awareness to it. Body language is something that if your child can really become aware of it, it can make such a huge difference in the classroom. And it is something, again, for somebody who's shy, it's something that's a little bit easier to make a change. Um, I'm going to talk about body language in a second, but I want to ask you another question. Um, are there any other ideas that you have? We've gone through those four, right? Any other ideas on how your child can attract people to them? And I want this to kind of be the beehive mind here because the more things we can come up with, the better. I could have made a slide with like 20 things, but I think it's always better if we think of them together. So if there's anything, you can put those in the chat box and we can, um, we can all benefit from that. One second. Okay, I think everything is still working here. Something weird just happened on my screen. All right, and well, you know, if, the, if it comes up as we go, pop it in there if you think of other things. All right. Okay, so body language. If you just look at these two different kids here, the one on the left, he's looking up, his eyes are open, nothing's in his hands, he's not busy doing anything, his arms aren't crossed in front of him. He looks like someone who is more ready to talk to someone, right? Um, the girl on the left, uh, her head's on the desk, and it says to people, don't bother me. I don't want to talk to anyone. So these are a little bit on the extremes, but ask your child if, like, how they can sit in their desk or sit at their table or sit at the lunch table and be open. How can they signal that they are open to connecting to others? One of the things that we do as adults and our kids do if they have a phone is when you're sitting there and you have no one to talk to, what do we do? We grab our phones, we open it, we're scrolling, we're playing a game. When we're doing that, you're sign signaling to the other person, don't bother me, I am busy. Same thing with if they're reading a book or they're organizing their backpack or they're doing homework, it says don't bother me or if they have the big headphones on. The other thing is, those are things around, is your child with the hands across the chest, with the hoodie on and the, the head down. Are they, they small? Are they big? Are they looking up? Are they looking down? All of these things can make it easier or harder to connect with people around you. 
So the best thing, especially the first couple of days of school is for your child to sit at their desk. They don't have to be sitting upright. That's a little odd for these age groups, but to not be slouched totally over, to look around the classroom, there's things to read, there's signs to read and be more open. Don't have their hands crossed. These are things that our kids don't really think about. So if we can bring it to their attention, then it's small things they can change that can help promote connection with others. Um, RH is saying, it helps my daughter to remember that everyone else is probably nervous too. Yes, absolutely. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. That is, uh, they really need to know that. Okay, conversation tips. We want your kids, especially if they're shy or have social anxiety, we want them to know what to talk about, how to talk about it. This particular thing, conversation skills, took such a hit during the pandemic. There were months of Zoom calls, which a lot of kids didn't have even their video on, right? They were in isolation. If they were together, they had masks on. So that really impeded their um, ability to have a conversation, to read emotions, to read when those pauses were coming. Um, and for some kids, there really was a lot of time with no interaction with people, none whatsoever except for family. And that's a whole different thing, right? So the texting skills, the social media skills, those things were honed. But the converse, conversation skills were very weakened. Even for some of us as adults, when we weren't out a lot, I think of the first time you went to a grocery store or a restaurant or a party, it was like, oh my gosh, I'm not quite sure how to behave anymore. So this summer is a great time for you to help your child to practice these conversation skills. So whether you're with family and like a family gathering, if you're with friends of the family, if they're with friends, if you're at a restaurant, a grocery store, a theme park, let your child do more of the talking than normal. If they're going to go to a restaurant, have them order. If they're going to, um, if they're starting a new sport, have them talk to the coach, have them talk to their teammates. It may be really hard for you if you have been stepping in and they're on the shy side, to stay there and let the silence be there. Sometimes you can even just walk away. You can say to them, um, I need you to check in with the coach. I'm going to go over here or I need you to go order your stuff. Here's the credit card. I'm going to be over here so that you you show them not only that they can do it, but you show them that you believe in them, that they can do it. So you got to give them those opportunities. Okay. So for school, let's get specific about this. One of the things that I want you to do, if you can get your child on board, is to brainstorm the topics that they can talk about with their classmates. Remember I was saying that uncertainty is what really fuels the anxiety. So if you can give them some specific things to talk about, or they can come up with the idea, I should say, then they walk into these potential connections with people around them with some ideas of what to talk about. Here's a few that are really easy and really natural in the first few weeks of school because they're relevant to everyone, okay? So what did you do this summer? Not everybody goes on trips, but everybody did something. Whether it was, I did nothing, I stayed at home, that's still doing something. Whether it's, you know, I played video games for five hours a day, or I went on some amazing trip. Everybody's got a story about summer. Um, what classes teachers do you have? Everybody wants to talk about that. Are you planning to do any clubs? This gives your child an opportunity to know who has similar interests, but also if they connect with someone in their class and they're like, I really like that person, they were nice. If they join the same club, it gives them more time with that person to potentially become friends. And are you doing any sports this year? Not everyone does sports. If your kid hates sports, this is still a good conversation starter because if they say, are you doing any sports? And this person says, yes, I'm doing, you know, names off five sports. They may be like, hmm, maybe this person could be a potential friend, but maybe not um, something they'll have to decide. So it is a, a question that's relevant for everybody. All right, now it's time for you to, uh, to give me the beehive mind again. So I wanna know what other topics you think would be kind of a natural and easy thing to talk about in the first three weeks of school. This is something that I would love to, if we can get some ideas from you, it might be a good idea um, 
Anu, to put this as like a social media post of topic ideas for people, for your kids to talk about the first three weeks of school. So if you can think of any, you can just pop that into the chat box. So the ones, as a reminder, I'm going to pop back to this last slide. So, so far we have, what did you do this summer? What classes teachers do you have? Are you planning to do any clubs? Are you doing any sports this year? Let's think of some that are for our little guys. Like what are some ideas that they would talk about? They, they might ask about, um, let's see, Roblox or Minecraft. Some of the younger kids play that. Um, what classes are you taking? Did you take notes? Uh, volunteer activities. That's a really good one, Ruby. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, what pets do you have? Oh, that's a really good one for everybody, but also for the littles, right? Book fair is talking about that. Where did you go to elementary school, right? Or where did you go to middle school? Um, yeah, that's great. Awesome. I love it. Yeah, what pets do you have? Everybody loves their pets, right? If they have pets, they are just going to all of a sudden feel warm and fuzzy, open up more to connection. That's a really good one. Okay. Okay, we are going to cover two moments of school. I'm talking about for the littles first and then the middle and high school that are really, um, really difficult times of day. If your kid is in elementary school, recess can be a big social stressor of the day. Like who are they going to play with? Who are they going to talk to? Where do they go if no one will play with them? Um, it's important for you to talk about this. If your kid is in a situation where they don't have friends in school or they've had a difficult year last year, talk about recess before the first day of school, um, especially if your kid is socially anxious or shy. Ask them how they would ask someone if they can play with them. Give them the words that they can use or have them brainstorm the words. So they might say something as simple as, hey, do you want to play basketball with me? And then also teach them what to do if the person says no. If the person says, no, I don't want to play basketball, they can follow up with, is there something else you want to play? Or something else you'd like to play? So the, the rejection is okay and normalized. And then they might say no to that. And then that's okay too. Now you can also say, how would you ask if you can join a group that's already playing something? That might be, do you have room for one more? Or can I play two? And again, if they say no, what's your follow up? You could say that's too bad, maybe tomorrow. Something super simple. It's also a great idea um, for them to start asking about recess even before they get out to recess. Because if you've ever watched kids on the playground going out to recess, there's either the kids who already have their group and they run out really fast. And there's the kids who kind of walk out slowly and they're looking around, scanning, where do I go? Who do I talk to? And it's a very um, stressing, stress moment of the day. So teach your child to ask in the morning um, before they go out to recess to ask people, hey, what are you going to do at recess? Do you want to play basketball with me at recess? Um, do you want to play hopscotch or whatever it is that they're into? have them practice those words. And again, it's important to normalize that there may be rejection. You're not going to use that word, but let them know. Some people may say no, and that's absolutely okay. But if you don't ask, you don't know. And the only way you're definitely not going to get them to say yes is if you never ask. So start creating this mindset of it's a right if they say no. Now on to the time that is the biggest social stressor for our middle and high schoolers, and that is lunchtime. This can be an extremely difficult time. Um, I talk to a lot of teens who are having friendship issues, and I get texts and I even get calls during lunchtime of Coach Sherry, how do I handle this? I've got nowhere to sit. I've like I'm in the library. I feel bad about myself, and nobody's gonna ever want to sit with me. This really is a time that has a big social impact on them as far as how they're thinking about things and their mindset. So we want to prepare them for lunchtime, especially for kids who are going from elementary to middle school. This is something new for them that they don't just have a cafeteria or a classroom setting, that it's this big cafeteria with lots of options and often in middle and high school at least, the kids can sit almost anywhere and in middle school, it just depends on the school. 
So the first few weeks of school are when the kind of areas of the class of the cafeteria are claimed. Um, if you ask middle school and high schoolers to draw out where people sit in their school, they typically can, especially for high school. They've got, they'll say, here's the academic kids, here's the jocks, here's the stoner kids, here's the drama kids. They can tell you exactly where they are in the school. So like I said, these spots are claimed in the first few weeks of school. And obviously there is a hierarchy of the younger kids to the older kids. Older kids kind of can push the younger kids out. So if your child's new to a school or there's a transition of some sort, it may be a school transition, but it could also be a friendship transition. Maybe during the summer, their friendships that they had dissipated. Maybe there was a breakup of friendships at the end of school last year. So um, we want to make sure, especially if your kid's in that situation, that we've got them set for um, lunchtime. I asked my 19-year-old um, my daughter, what advice should I give kids about this? Like, what do they need to do during lunchtime? And she said, they need to be bold. This is a time to be bold. And that means asking people, asking people to sit together at lunch. It works best if it's done, just like with recess, if it's done before lunchtime. So have your child in the morning before lunchtime, start asking people, what lunch period do you have? Can I sit with you? Is there room at the table? They could say, they could be vulnerable and say, I'm new to the school and I don't have anyone to sit with. Do you have room at your table? Um, you know, things like that. But it does take, you gotta be bold to do that because you are setting yourself up for rejection. But if you don't ask, you don't know what the answer is gonna be. So if they aren't able to get a solid yes from somebody before lunchtime, then they're gonna walk into that cafeteria confidently they're going to go get in the line for food. And I actually do recommend that if they are in this boat, that they don't take their lunch perhaps for the first couple of days. So they go to the line. It gives them more opportunity to connect with the people in the line around them, especially the first few days where people are learning the um, learning how it works. They're usually a longer line. So they can be in line and talking to the people around them. Again, you got to be bold. But they can ask questions, um, you know, which one looks best to you? What are you going to get today? Um, I don't know how the how you pay for lunch. Can you help me out? So talking about the situation that all of them are in, right? So it's not awkward at all. And you could potentially ask one of those people. If they are talkative and giving you the signal they're willing to connect. You can ask them, hey, can I sit with you today? And let's say they don't get anyone to say yes in the morning they don't get anyone in line to say yes, then they're going to have to walk out and have some courage and sit down at a table. And it's best if they don't go to the far corner of the cafeteria where they're away from everybody, but rather they sit at a table where there's people around them for potential connections, right? Is this bringing up anything for people um, thinking about their own teen years? It's kind of a lot. I know I had um, in middle school, we actually were allowed to go off campus. And so it's, um, it was kind of crazy. You definitely had to get some, some yeses before, um, before you got to lunch. All right, this is what I think it was RH was talking about um, up above in the chat box about the other kids. There is a mindset that takes over for especially a lot of tweens and teens and sometimes our younger little ones, but it's the idea that they need to wait for the other kids around them to talk first. And there's also the idea that everybody else has got this all figured out. I'm the only one that's going through it, which we all know is not the case. So it does help for your child to understand that most all the people around you are in the same boat they're a little bit nervous they're making new friends new connections they are also attending the first day of school some people are going to be new at the school they don't know who those people are and they aren't um, but it's it's not that your child is the only one in this situation so that doesn't just make everything better but it can make them realize oh yeah i'm not the only one and the friendship circle, which is a support group that I run for girls, and we talk a lot about this kind of the mindset of how they think about the other kids. So there's an example that happens quite often. 
When I ask someone, um, who did you talk to today at school? They might say, no one, no one talked to me. And I always have to laugh and ask them, did you talk to anyone? And nine times out of 10, they say no. So they are in the mindset of they need permission to talk to that other person. They need that person to talk first in order for them to then respond. And when we can tell our kids, no, everybody's waiting for someone to talk to them, then they can begin to feel like they're doing people a favor. They're spreading kindness by talking to people around them. And the first week of school, there's a ton of kids that have this mindset of, I just need to wait for someone to talk to me. And so your child, if they can be bold and get up the courage, they can be that person to break the ice at their group table or the people around them in their classroom or the people at lunch or the people in the line to say, we don't all have to be silent here. We don't have to wait for permission to speak to each other. We can all make the choice to connect with each other. And a lot of times when you've got that person that does talk first, the other kids are so relieved. It's like, oh my gosh, we don't have to just be here sitting here silently, especially the, the table groups where they're all kind of looking at each other. Um, it can really be great when one of the kids actually talks. All right, Angela says that she asks her daughter to give at least one person a compliment a day. Yeah, that's great. It's, you know, we're talking about giving them specific things and that is something that um, they feel like they're doing something good. They don't need permission for it. And the only thing I would say with that is add on to that, that um, give someone a compliment and don't worry about what they say back. Some kids are gonna be kind of like, oh, I don't even know what to do with that. It's kind of hard to take compliments sometimes. I work on that myself. But so yeah, I just tell her, give a compliment a day and don't worry about the other person's reaction. It's a great idea. Right, here's a few things that I think it's important to avoid. Um, when you're giving your child advice, we have to remember they are kids, they're not adults. So making friends is different. It's a different environment. It's a different, there's a different set of rules is all I can say. So be really mindful of the advice that you're giving them, all right? So the first thing is just saying to your kid, just talk to someone. Now you're probably thinking that completely contradicts what I was just saying, but when you have just talked to someone in a bubble, that's the only thing you're giving to your kids, it makes it seem so easy. And to them, it's like, mom, dad, you don't get it at all. But when you're telling them, talk to someone, encouraging them, giving them the skills to do that, the conversation skills, it's completely different. So, um, and also this one, I hear this from a lot of kids who are having friendship issues. When their parents will say, just talk to someone, they feel this huge sense of failure. They feel like, oh, my parents think I'm doing this all wrong. Or if I just talk to someone, I would make a new friend. It would be that easy. So um, we have to just be mindful about using this phrase. Doesn't mean we can't encourage them to talk to people, but it's not a standalone comment. Um, just introduce yourself. This is an interesting one. Kids don't introduce themselves. Uh, we might be, as adults, if we went to a conference, let's say, you would go to a table, you might say, hi, my name is Sherry, I'm with TeenWise. And in the teen world, if you do that, people are going to look at you like you are really weird. Why are you introducing yourself to me? Um, add a handshake and forget it. Half the people aren't going to talk to you again. So um, the way that it actually works in even the little kid world too is you go up, you have a little bit of a conversation interaction about something, and then casually you drop your name. So it's backwards from how a lot of adults would do it. You start out with connecting and then, oh, by the way, my name is Sherry. And that's how it would go. So we have to be careful with the just go introduce yourself to people. The next thing is you have nothing to worry about. We say this because we love our kids and we care about them. We don't want them to be anxious and worried about the first day of school or about making friends or about making connections. But when we say this, they take it as you're minimizing what they're going through. Because they're like, yeah, I've got a lot to worry about. I don't know if Johnny's gonna talk to me. I don't know if Sarah's gonna be my friend anymore. I don't know who I'm gonna play with at recess or who I'm gonna sit with at lunch. So when you say you have nothing to worry about, it's not validating all that they're going through. It's minimizing us. We have to be careful with that phrase. 
And then, yes, um, I'm guilty of that. I can sometimes minimize her feelings when I encourage her to get out there. Yeah, we do that because we care about them, right? Like, oh, that's no big deal. Don't worry about it. Just go do it. Um, so we just have to watch ourselves. And when we become aware of that minimizing, then we can change up our language. And it really adds a whole new layer of support that we can offer to our kids. Um, my daughter has maternal attendency, so I try to redirect that to reach out to help people. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. If you've got a, a child who's a nurturer, the person who likes to take care of people, you can absolutely phrase this as you're not trying to make a friend, although they might, um, but you're trying to support and help people around you. Okay, the last one, everyone will love you. Of course, we want that for our kids. And we think that because we love our kids so much. We see the amazingness. We love everything about them, even though sometimes they drive us crazy. We love them so much. But when we say this, it's an eye roll moment for our kids. They're like, of course, you're going to say that, right? And they're just like, you know, use the teen word. It's just cringe to them when you say something like this. Um, they know you're obligated to say this. Um, they know everyone's not going to love them. And it also reduces your street cred if you say to them, everyone's going to love you because they're like, that's just not true. Is anything standing out for you on this stuff that we're talking about? That's a lot of stuff we're going through. Okay. All right, this is not supposed to be avoid. This is going to be stuff um, that we should do. So ixnay on the avoid. These are things you want to work on. Saying things like, how are you feeling? Is there anything I can do to help? Um, what are you most excited about? It might be kind of hard, but you can do this. These are some things you can say as they're starting school, coming home and things are going on. Maybe they had a great day. Maybe they didn't have a great day but that you can be there to support them. And notice the second one. Is there anything I can do to help? This is saying I'm not doing this for you, but I'm here for you. I'm here for you. If you want that advice, you're kind of starting planting that seed, but you're not saying here's what you need to do. If you've gone through some of this stuff over the summer that we've been talking about tonight, you might say, oh, I wonder if there's anything that we had talked about preparing that you could work on. Is there something you want to practice with me? Do you need me to brainstorm with you so that it's a collaborative moment versus I'm going to fix it and tell you how you need to do this? Now, I want you also to remember this, that as they're going through all of the social stuff, especially in the first few weeks of school. Um, it might be a, a really big emotional roller coaster for your kids. There might be days where they are rejected. When they put themselves out there, they connect with people, they're vulnerable and they get rejected. They might experience that. They might have, you know, they might cry, they might be angry, they might be frustrated. All of those emotions are okay. They can feel all of those emotions and it's okay. It's not your job to take those feelings away from them. It's only your job to support them to process through those emotions and to know that they're unconditionally loved at home. So you can let yourself kind of relax a little bit, knowing you don't have to fix it all. You don't have to make them happy. That's not your job either. You just have to be there for them, listen to them, validate their feelings. And make sure that your child knows that you believe in them. Because when you say to them, you've got this, I believe you can do this, you're telling them, you're reminding them, you can do this. And when their confidence wanes, they need to hear this from you. They need to feel this from you. They might lash out at you. They might be mad and say, I don't have this. I can't do this. But you're just going to stay calm and you are going to be there like the emotional rock they need saying, I know you can do this. I know this is hard right now. I can tell that you're really sad, but you can do this. All right, let me catch up in the chat box for a sec. All right, so if your kid happens to miss the first few days of school, of days, sorry, let me start over. So if your kiddo happens to miss the first few days or weeks, is it difficult for them to recover? It is not, I don't wanna say it's not difficult, it's more challenging, let's put it that way. It doesn't mean that they can't do it, but when they come in, they're going to kind of be, there's going to be a little bit of 
the stuff that's already structured, right? The where people are sitting, who they're hanging out with at lunch. But it doesn't mean that, oh, forget it, your your kid is like not gonna have a social life for that year. It just means that they're gonna have to really be mindful and aware when they walk in, have this friendship plan and know that it may just be a little bit tougher. But um, it may also be a little bit better because kids are not gonna be as stressed. You just don't know, you just don't know, but it can be a little more difficult. Okay, um, we're learning to support social relationships when our children are shy and have a hard time making friends. But what can teachers or adults do to support the other side so that children are more happy to accept others and not just say no, that they can be more accepting of others? Okay, I'm going to um, table that just for a minute because we are going to, that's actually my next slide. All right, you got this, this is so important. Don't try to fix everything. Yes. Am I just joined? Is there a recording available? Um, Val and Anu, I'm going to have you answer that. Okay. Um, oh, you just did. Thanks, Anu. Um, many things to avoid saying totally agree. I recently told my kids I hate meeting new people. I feel so awkward. I feel myself getting anxious before gatherings where I don't know people and I'm terrible at remembering names. They found this fascinating and also so funny because I talk to everyone and anyone and always introduce people to one another in social groups. Yeah, that's so great because your kids sometimes, especially if they're younger when teens, not as much, but um, when they learn about our own struggles and weaknesses, they're like, oh, wow. Especially when you have found methods to overcome them, right? I personally, I am an extreme introvert and extremely shy. And so, but my kids are like, how do you go give presentations and talks and go to conferences? And it's because I come up with my friendship plan. It's not a, a friendship plan as much, but it's a connection plan. What am I gonna talk about? Like I'm going to New York next week for a conference. I know the people in the group that I'm going with um, only through Zoom. And so I'm already starting to think, what am I gonna talk about when I'm there? What, who am I going to have lunch with? How do I set that up? All of the things we're talking about tonight, I still do because I'm shy. And so I need to have these plans, right? Okay. All right. So um, I see, Angela. I have taken my daughter to work to observe me when I present or run meetings with people so she can see that I fumble on my words, get sweaty pits, etc. This is so good. So good. Yeah. We want them to see that we we make mistakes or that we have things that are difficult for us, right? Yeah, absolutely, I love it. So we need to start thinking about how can we show that vulnerability to our kids, right? Okay, school support. This goes back to, um, I believe it was Melanie's question. Martha, sorry. Okay, so um, so we can work on things from our side, but sometimes your child might need support at school. It might be that you have recognized these patterns for the past few years, so you know at the get-go your child needs support. It may be after the first few weeks that you're like, yeah, things just aren't working. Maybe after the first week that maybe you need support from the counselor. So reach out to them. And just know that the counselor, just like you, can't fix everything. But sometimes the counselor can work in conjunction with the teacher to make certain arrangements in the classroom. And the best thing is for this to not be like so obvious. Um, so you may have to, I hate to say this, but you may have to ask for that specifically that please don't make this obvious that there's an intervention for my daughter when it comes to social stuff because especially middle and high school, that can be something that really is a negative in the social world. Um, I'll give you an example of how it should not be done, and then we'll talk about some potential ways it could be um, helpful at the school level. So let's say your child's in middle school having dif difficulty with social things. So you go to the counselor. The counselor goes to the teacher and says to the teacher, um, Veronica is not feeling a lot of, um, she's feeling like very alienated and needs help making friends. So this loving teacher, well-meaning, goes to a girl in the classroom who is maybe a little more social and says, hey, um, Veronica is having some issues making friends. I'm hoping that you can come sit by her and maybe talk to her and show her around the school. And um, that is is not the way to go because it says to that other girl this person has social issues and you your daughter doesn't want that to be kind of magnified or, or 
you know, told across the school. So um, how it could work is that the teacher moves somebody who's more social to sit by the person who's more shy without saying that piece of it. Just moving them and saying, we're making some movement, you know, changing some seating around in the classroom without giving that explanation. Um, another thing that the teachers can do or the counselors, the counselors, sorry, not the teachers, is some of the counselors are teaching social emotional intelligence. They are teaching um, conversational skills. Not all of the schools have this, but a few of them do. So reach out to the counselor and ask about this. They may have a specialty counselor on site, but they also themselves may be doing that. And um, also maybe set up so that your child has the connection with the counselor in case they need to go in for that support. But this should be done kind of on the down low, so to speak, so that it's not um, you know, announced to other kids in the school that your child is having social issues. Okay. Um, let me see here if there's anything else I have missed. No, I think we're good. Okay, so um, I mentioned uh, a couple of times the coaching and stuff that I do. So there's two things I want to mention about myself and TeenWise and the support that I offer. Um, one is that I have a Facebook group that is specifically for moms with daughters who are going through girl drama and friendship issues. And if you don't have a daughter, if you don't have a daughter going through girl drama or friendship issues, you can still pop into that Facebook group because I have a lot of videos that are about connecting with your kids and about supporting them through friendship and such. And most of it is also relevant for boys. So don't feel like if you don't have a daughter that you, you can't come into the group. So you can do that with the bottom QR code here, just pop into that group. Um, and then also the, one of the things that I have been asked by parents is to create a workshop for kids to create their friendship plan. So we have in, I think it's two weeks, the first week of August, we have an online workshop for kids who are in middle school, especially good for kids going from elementary to middle. And we have one for kids going into high school or they can already be in high school. But we're gonna go through some of the stuff that we learned tonight, but I'll be doing that directly with your kids. And it's online, um, it's interactive, it's not a webinar like tonight, it's gonna be an actual meeting, a Zoom meeting, so that we will be able to connect the tricky part of that is they're going to have an opportunity to practice these conversational skills and social skills just by being on that call, because I'll be asking them questions, asking them to interact. We may do a breakout room, I'm not sure, because kids not necessarily like breakout rooms, but we're going to go over these things so that your child is going to leave with a friendship plan. They're going to leave thinking about the clubs they're interested in, the topics of conversation, things about themselves that they can bring up. So if you're interested in that, you can just pop onto that, um, the QR code. And like I said, there's a separate one for the middle schoolers and the high schoolers. Um, Let's see, anything else I'm missing here? I think one thing, um, I'm going to go into questions. We can ask more in-depth questions if you'd like. But I just want to, to remind you that um, your kids, they're going to go through some difficult times and feel these difficult emotions, and it's OK. It's OK. It is building up their resilience. It is giving them an opportunity to learn about themselves. It's giving them an opportunity to learn new social skills and relationship skills and how to navigate those things. And it's giving an opportunity to experience those difficult emotions and understand that they can get past those difficult emotions. They don't last forever. So it's really good for them to understand that. Right. And um, like I said, I'm going to stay around for questions, but before you pop off, if you can put in the chat box for me just an aha moment or something that you think you're going to be able to use. I always love to hear that. It's very helpful for me when I'm creating presentations for you to know what um, what is resonating with you. The other thing is, if you have um, ideas for topics for this upcoming year of Parent Chats, please pop those into the chat as well. All right. Um, do you have worksheets that kids can do on their own or with parents? Not sure if she'd be willing to do the workshop. 
Let's see. I don't yet. And I'm actually doing a new certification right now, working on some interesting ways to bring some of this to kids um, at all ages. But um, I don't have that yet. I'm so sorry. If she's not willing to do the workshop, you can always um, contact me about potentially private coaching. And um, I typically don't do single sessions. But as we're gearing up for the school year, sometimes I will do a special um, one off session. Um, that's just to create this friendship plan. So, yeah. Okay. All right. Any questions? Like I said, it can be very specific to your family and your child if you have any questions. Help for foster children. All right, Amanda, can you expand on that? Help for friendship issues, social issues? Is there something specific in there? I'll just wait for a second while you, while you think about that. Now, one thing I will say as I'm waiting for your answer to that is um, I would love to do more of these workshops for foster children. Um, I know that they often are sent to new schools over and over. Um, keep in mind all the stuff that we are talking about tonight is the same thing for them. Like have them think about what are the things they can talk about when they're entering a new school? What are the um, kinds of friends that they're looking for? Who do they want to hang out with? What clubs can they join that are of interest to them? Um, what are their hobbies? What are things they can have on them that attract people to them to, so that other people are asking them questions instead of them having to reach out? And then also foster kids have been through a lot. So their body language can often show that understandably because they're carrying a lot of emotions with them. So if you can work on um, body language with foster kids of how to be more open to connection through body language, that can be very helpful for them to, to make new connections and friends, right? Bye, Angela, thanks for coming tonight, appreciate it. Okay, all right, got it, Amanda, I hear you. All right, so um, I hope that all of you have gotten something out of tonight. I know every time I sit down to make these presentations, new stuff comes up and, and I, I just feel what the kids are going through and what you as parents are going through because I wish that I could say, here's how to fix it all, but we just can't do that. We just have to walk you know, beside them or even behind them as they're going through all of these ups and downs of of um, making friends and connections and um, that can be really hard sometimes but don't forget as i said they have the strength to do this and so do you so don't forget you got this all right everyone have a fantastic evening